Sí. Bon dia, bona tarda a tothom. Avui, today is one of our sessions. Remember, this is what we call the dialogues, and we have these dialogues to see different views on issues in science and society, society and thought. So, in the in the different dialogues, we are seeing very, very different issues, and always we try to have separate or maybe uh, we could call even opposite views or complementary views on, 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 on some issues. One month it is in Catalan or Spanish and in, it is much more for the, white, uh, for the white audience and the other one is in English and uh, is more at the level of, of experts. Uh, in all the cases, what we have is uh, that the, the Barcelona hub of the Academia Europea is trying two things. One, to make science known, and second, to show that we have good science. And for that, uh, remember the, the, the Academy, we are at the Fundació Catalana per la Recerca i la Innovació, and we are part of them, even though we have a, a, an independent way of, of doing or, or program uh, of ourselves. And uh, we are collaborating with several institutions to, to fulfill our goals. In this case, we are very, very, very uh, thankful to the, the, the Royal Academy, the RACAP, where we are right now in one of the settings, the nicer settings uh, for science in Barcelona. And uh, this, the, 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 the hub, the Barcelona hub of the academy is being sustained by the, the Secretary of Research and the, the municipality. We are very uh, we are very happy to have uh, the the talk today, in which we are going to have different views. But my role finishes with the the presentation of Gemma Marfan. She is a, a professor of genetics at the University of Barcelona, and uh, I should say that you uh, she is a very good uh, writer. Uh, and she usually writes uh, in the newspapers in Ara, and she's doing a very, a very interesting uh, work for for science dissemination. Thank you very much. To the Barcelona Knowledge Hub, the Southern European and Mediterranean hub of the Academia Europea. Academia Europea was founded in 1988 as an, an international, non-governmental association of scientists and scholars from all disciplines. It aims to promote research, learning and education in all areas of knowledge. Now, it has a thriving membership of more than 5,000 scholars and scientists, amongst them more than 80 Nobel laureates. Academia Europea has a network of regional knowledge hubs to decentralize activities. The Barcelona Knowledge Hub started at 2013. Its main goal is to promote scientific dissemination and build on excellence in scholarship, with special emphasis on transversal perspectives of the natural and exact sciences, social sciences and humanities. Its vision is to turn science into shared common value among all citizens and to become a hub of thought and dialogue on global challenges facing humanity. To fulfill its mission and vision, the Barcelona Knowledge Hub carries out activities such as Frontiers, scientific dialogues held in English at a high academic level. Agora, dialogues for a wide local audience in Catalan or Spanish. Disputatio of Barcelona, an annual academic debate held between two renowned experts. The Barcelona Ipatia European Science Prize, awarded in collaboration with the Barcelona City Council exploration and development of synergies between science and art, outreach activities to enhance visibility of the research ecosystem of Catalonia. 
the Barcelona Knowledge Hub will continue to encourage achievement of the highest possible standards in scholarship, research and education. So, welcome everyone to this fantastic session. Both those of you that are here presentially, attending here, but also all the people that are listening and attending in streaming. I am Gemma Marfan, as Gemma Bertan Petit already presented me. I'm professor of genetics at the University of Barcelona, and I'm honored to be the moderator and a spectator of this truly wonderful debate with Dr. Roderick Guigo at my left on my right, and Dr. Alfonso Martinez Arias at my left, whose merits I will be commenting in a few minutes. In this European Forum of Ideas, we are going to introduce and debate one of the most fundamental, if not the real core question, in biology, at the interface between philosophy and experimental data. What defines us and gives us identity as organisms. Is it the genome, the whole package of inherited genes passed from our progenitors, bits and pieces of our, ancestor, our ancestors, or is it the cell, the working bricks that conform our bodies from the burgeoning stem cells in the early embryo to the talkative interacting cells that self-assemble and give rise to all known tissues and organs. I will now proceed to introduce our speakers one by one, but I hope that you will allow me to provide a very quick overview of their achievements. But mostly, I will focus on their scientific interests. I believe that papers, titles and jobs are like stamps on a passport. It tells you where people have been and visited but do not really tell you what are the interests, what they've been doing. So in a way, I will try just to give you a brief glimpse of the training and career life research um, of these two speakers to, to provide a better understanding of the scientific uh, views, knowledge and expertise that every one of them will just put forward here. So let's start with uh, this hopefully very fruitful debate. And I'm pleased to introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Rodrigo Guigo. He is currently professor of the University Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and also the head of the computational biology of RNA processing at the Center for Genomics Regulation, also the, in Barcelona. But uh, when did he start working on science? Well, at the university, Dr. Guigo studied both biology and philosophy and obtained his PhD in statistics applied to population genetics and evolutionary ecology. So that gives you already this view of interdisciplinarity. At the time when most scientists outside genetics hardly knew anything about the genome and the immense information encoded in DNA, he did his postdoctoral stay in Los Alamos National Laboratory. LANL. I don't know if it still exists, but I can tell you that I, when I was very young, I am a geneticist, it was really at the forefront of the genomics, which has, at the moment was the budding science about sequencing genes of many different organisms. And it is very important to remember that due to the people and the vision at LANL, it was instituted the Gene Bank, which was one of the first banks from genetic data. So any person, any scientist who had any DNA sequence of any organism, before publishing it, they should submit it to Gene Bank. And it would be released and public, so that anyone in the world could really work with that and benefit from that. So this is also something that I think is worth just telling, because you know, people have a story and science has a story, and it's good just to remember where everyone is. So, genomics and bioinformatics are extremely linked, and Dr. Rigo was involved in these big, big genome projects, all the genome projects, in different ways, in the Human Genome Project, Drosophila Project, Mouse Genome Project, 
Uh, and then after that, how DNA was encoding function. So then how there, uh, these genes that are involved in the organism give rise to different tissues in a way of how to interpret, how to read and interpret genetic information. So at the very end, I would say that his work now present, um, is foc the, the current work now is focused on understanding how the genetic information in the genome encodes function. Although Dr. Guigo uh, does not write scientific divulgation books or podcasts or blogs as far as I know, he never declines to participate in any type of scientific divulgation activity like this debate today. And, and he uh, really uh, strives to share his knowledge on the advances of genomics, uh, science and societal impact. So be, now it's your turn, the floor is yours. So Roderick Igo is now going to produce his, his view on if it's the genome or the cell. Okay, I think I can skip the thank yous, right? But I actually also want to say that I learned a lot from Alfonso Martinez Arias, not actually biology because I am in a different field, but he was really instrumental in building the CRG and helping to build the CRG. And I was in the panel interviewing candidates and I had no experience because I was just the first time that I was a leader. And I really learned a lot on how to interview and how to think how an institute should be from, from you. So you may not remember because it was 20 years ago, but this is the thing. So also, I guess that this is, this is set as a sort of a debate and I am given the task of defending the genome, if I understand correctly. So I, that's what I try to do. And I, I, think I, can be, I think I can be quite quick. I think that uh, I will not answer the question of whether it's the genome or the cell, but I will ask you to to answer this question. This is probably the most famous experiment in biology, at, uh, at least in terms of the popular uh, press, right? This is the cloning of Dolly. I think most of you have heard about this experiment. So in this experiment, a cell, a cell from this ship was taken, the DNA from this ship was taken, the DNA from this ship was, insected, was inserted in the cell from this other ship, and the resulting cell was inserted in a third ship, and this third ship uh, gave rise to, to Dolly. So the question that I am asking you, of these three ships, which one do you think Dolly is a clone of? You can, I mean, of course, you have, there's only one answer. Yes, an answer, the answer is, uh, the answer you see that these two ships, these two these two ships have a blue face, they break, uh, a black face. These are the these are is, is, a, is a breed of, of ships that have black face. So Dolly doesn't have a, uh, uh, a black face because Dolly is a clone of the ship that gave the DNA. It's not a clone of the ship that gave the cell. It's not a clone of the ship in which the cell was developing into an embryo. So I think that's already, I think maybe we can finish here if you want, uh, Alfonso, or do you think that you still have arguments? <laughs> it's a joke, <laughs> anyway. Uh, also, let me tell you, <laughs> of course, because you gave me, the, uh, you have advantage because I have to speak the first and then you can already use uh, what I am saying in your arguments. But now you will be allowed to come to We are not? No, okay, fine. So anyway, so now the other thing I want to say is that nothing is specific, the, the term, so the words that we use to refer to the things um, are related to the importance and to the uniqueness that we give to this, the things that the words denote. Right, cell, we use the term cell in many different contexts, and only one of these, right, one of these is biology. The term genome is only used in one context, right, in the context of living beings. And even when we use genome as a metaphor, as we, use it, we usually do, that's the genome of the Barça Football Club, we actually use this term to refer to the thing that makes this thing unique and different. So I am a computational biologist and uh, Alfonso is a cellular biolo cell biologist. 
So I have a computational view of what is life, and Alfonso has a different view. And I think to be on the same page, I think it would be good for you to understand what I understand what life is. So since this is very, since this is a very, this is a very basic, and I understand that there are people here that are not biologists, what I'm going to tell now is actually very basic. It's high school biology. Okay, it's just high school biology. Uh, even though it's high school biology, that's not easy because, because, this is not my words, neither the concept of life nor the concept of computation are that clear. So even though we have an intuition of what life is, trying to define what life is is far from trivial. Right? So let me start with a recursive or progressive approximation to the definition of life. Right? So let me start with this sentence. So life on Earth is a molecule of DNA which has the capacity to produce a copy of itself. I mean, this is just the starting thing. So this is a DNA molecule. Of course, this is not a DNA molecule. This is a symbolic representation of a DNA molecule. Each of these letters correspond to a different chemical, which the structure of which are, are, are uh, depicted here. And these chemi this chemicals polymerize. So they arrange one after the other, producing long sequences of, this poly of these polymers that we conveniently represent by letters A, C, a TG that corresponds to the initials of these chemicals. Right? So this is, for instance, a, a representation of a fraction of uh, the DNA in our cells. Right? So these chemicals, though, uh, interact with each other. So A interacts with T and G interacts with C. And this, and because of this, really a, a, a DNA molecule is not a, it's not a single polymer. But actually, it's two anti-parallel anti, anti polymers, right? There are two chains of, we call it chains or strands or, or, or uh, polymers or whatever, right? So they are two parallel, anti-parallel polymers, so that every time that I have an A in one of the chains, in front of it I have a T, and when I have a C, I have a C, and this is just universal. And actually, the right thing to represent a DNA molecule would be this, because it has two strands, right? But the thing is that since one of the strands is univocally determined by the other, we don't need to. So this is the, this is the discovery of, uh, of uh, many scientists during the last century, mid-50s. This is Watson, Crick, uh, Will Kings, uh, Franklin, etc., etc., that published their findings in this paper that probably, if you have to choose one paper in biology from the 20th century, that would be the paper that most people would choose, like the relativity theory papers from Einstein in physics, for instance, right? And one thing that I wanted to say, and since I mentioned physics, right, so, is that this paper actually confirmed an hypothesis that uh, the famous physicist and lover, Erwin S. Rodiger, produced in a book that published 10 years before when nothing was known about the structure of the DNA. And uh, he actually, wrote in this book, it's a very short book, it's actually, to me, is one of the most important books in biology, and it's not written by a biologist, says that, uh, says, a well-ordered association of atoms, endowed with sufficient resistivity to keep its order permanently, order, I see, etc., etc., appears to be the only conceivable material structure that offers a variety of possible isomeric arrangements sufficient, sufficiently large to embody a complicated system of determinations within a small spatial boundary. And this means to me that the only way in which you can produce the diversity of life encoded in small cells is through some sort of encoding system. Something that with a limited number of basic elements can produce multiple messages. And actually he writes specifically before, 10 years before Watson and Crick found this structure that uh, Indeed, the number of atoms in such a structure need not to be very large to produce an almost unlimited number of possible arrangements. And he says, for illustration, think of the Morse code. Of course, he saw only two elements. The DNA is a little bit more complicated. They have four elements, right, encoding. There is a famous sentence at the end of this, at the end of this paper. And by the way, this paper is just one page long, right? The, probably the most important paper in biology of the 20th century is just one page long. It says, Watson and Crick writes at the end of this, it has not escaped our notice that the specific pairing we have postulated immediately suggests a possible coping mechanism for the genetic material. 
right? And remember what is my definition of life, a DNA molecule that can produce a copy of itself. And the mechanism is so simple that's almost embarrass embarrassingly simple. This is the molecule of DNA. How do I duplicate this molecule of DNA? Well, the molecule of DNA opens, and each of the two strands serves as a template to generate the complementary strand. So when I have an A, I have a T. When I have a C, I have a G. And on the other half, when I have a G, I have T, T etc., etc. And the DNA opens. Each template, each strand serves as template to generate, at the end, two identical copies of the same molecule. So I will use sometimes this representation instead of the letters because this is very cumbersome. So essentially what we have is a molecule of DNA that replicates into two copies this through a process called DNA replication. And this is not a spontaneous process. This does occur by itself. It needs of a machine to produce this replication. This machine is a protein called DNA polymerase. So this is the protein that makes possible the copying the duplication, the replication of the DNA. So that's not, the name is not very DNA polymerase, right? It's something, <laughs> it's something that polymerase is DNA. So DNA polymerase, the polymerase is a protein. This is, this is the DNA polymerase. Proteins are also polymeric. Proteins are also polymeric uh, molecules made of the repetition multiple times of a limited number of elements. In this case, amino acids, there are 20. And, in, but, uh, in contrast with DNA that always adopt the same helical structure, proteins adopt different structures depending on their amino acid sequence. Uh, so a convenient way of representing proteins is through their sequence. So this is the amino acid sequence of the DNA polymerase. Now we have a system, right? We have a system in which we have the DNA molecule and we have an element, a system that's able to produce a copy of this DNA element. So we, let me, uh, refine my definition of life. So life, and always on Earth, is a DNA molecule with the capacity to produce a copy of itself plus a machine that produces that copy. So on Earth, right, these two components are not floating in the environment. They are kept together. And one way, not the only way, but the way in which in the Earth this happened is to separate them from the environment through a membrane, right? So these two components are not floating. They are inside a compartment. This is very important. We call this compartment the cell. This is extremely important because this is, uh, it's not the only way, but this defines individuality, right? So you probably have not saw about this. This is obvious, is that when we associate life, we associate it to individuals. We talk about a dog, about a tree, about the parameter that we see in the microscope. So the cell is the basic of, definition, of, of, of defining the self against the foreign, as against the others. And this in biology is particularly relevant, in particular in immunology, right? In particular in immunology, but I will not go that way. So what do we have? We have a system, we have a system that a cell, with DNA and a, and, a, and a protein that copies the DNA, that produces two copies of this system. Uh, but there is a problem in this, in this picture, as you may have anticipated. I have this system, right? I have the DNA and I have the, I have the DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase produces a copy of the DNA. Now the cell divides for whatever reason. I have two copies of the DNA. Therefore, one of the resulting cells have the DNA and the DNA polymerase. But what happened on the other cell? What is the DNA polymerase coming in the other cell? And I think this is the key thing of life, right? I will emphasize this here at the end. This is the key thing of life. So this DNA sequence is not any DNA sequence. This DNA sequence contains the instructions to generate the DNA polymerase. And this is what separates life from any other natural phenomena. So this is what I said, the DNA sequence contains instructions to synthesize the DNA polymerase. More specifically, the nucleotide sequence of the DNA specifies the amino acid sequence of the DNA polymerase. And this is through, uh, so, and I think this is what, what I want to emphasize. So life is a DNA molecule with the capacity to produce a copy of itself, 
la seva machine that produce the copy, such that the instructions to build the machine are encoded in the DNA sequence. Uh, this process is, uh, is a little bit more complicated. The, well, how the amino acid sequence of the protein is encoded in the DNA is through two steps. First step, the DNA is copied into a molecule of, of an RNA molecule. An RNA molecule is also a polymer of, nucle of bases of nucleotides of letters. The only difference is that instead of a T, we have a U. And because of this chemical change, RNA doesn't form double helices. It's actually a linear molecule. And we, to, to produce the RNA from the DNA, it's again a very simple, it's again a very extremely simple and elegant model. So one of the two strands of the DNA opens and serves as a template to generate the complementary RNA molecule, right? It's very simple. Anybody could do that. Just uh, okay. when you have an A, I put a T, or when I have a, when a U, actually, whatever. Anyway, so this is the process of uh, transcription to RNA. And of course, this is not spontaneous. It needs something that makes this, that generates the RNA polymer from the DNA. And the enzyme is called RNA polymerase. It's another protein. This is the RNA polymerase, actually in the action of transcribing the DNA molecule, the RNA molecule. And again, this can be represented by the sequence of amino acids of this protein, which would determine the sequence would univocally determine the structure of the protein. So the second, this is the first step. The second next step is the translation of this molecule to, of RNA to protein. And this is a little bit more complex, but it's still extremely simple. In this particular case, each three letters in the molecule of RNA determine one letter, one amino acid in the protein sequence. And this is through, uh, so for instance, the first two letters, ACU, determine the amino acid uh, threonine, which we denote by the letter T. Actually, each, each amino acid can be denoted by a letter, uh, so as, as the DNA. So, and this is not arbitrarily. This is done through, thanks to very specific rules that are defined in what is called the genetic code, right? The genetic code. So when I have uh, this thing, ACU, I go to where ACU is, I don't know, here, ACU, I see that this goes through in, and this is a T. And then when I go to, when I see GUA, I go where GUA is, which I don't know what it is, uh, GU, GUA here, and I put a balloon, a V, and so on, and end up having, right, the amino acid sequence determined univocally by the sequence of the RNA, correct? This is called the genetic code, and this is a universal. It's almost identical in all life things on Earth. So, to, again, this is not a spontaneous process. We need something to do this, and this is done through the ribosome. The ribosome is not, it's a little bit more complicated than the protein, but I will use the word protein to refine to the ribosome, of course. It is not that, but it's enough to understand this. I just wanted to say something. This is this flux of information, right, from DNA to DNA, from DNA to RNA, and from RNA to protein, is what Watson, is what Crick's uh, uh, denominate the central dogma of molecular biology, right? That's how the flux of information. And I want to say something because maybe we heard this, we heard this word noise or uh, stochasticity or whatever. This is not a, a stochastic process. This is a fully deterministic process. This is a process that occurs in total precision. If I change ACU by ATU, the resulting amino acid will be different, right? It's a computation. It's exactly a computation. A computation in which, for instance, from RNA to protein, the input is a stream, string in a particular alphabet, and the output is a string in a different output. Output at the program is the genetic code. The instructions that make the translation, the, the transformation of one string into another. And of course, there are errors, as there are errors on the CPUs of the computers, but these errors are in general corrected. So, this is the system that we have. Something that appears, something like this appeared on Earth about 3.5 billion years ago. It's a system in which we have a DNA molecule, we have a protein that's able to produce a copy of the DNA molecule, and then we have two additional proteins, right, that are necessary to synthesize the molecule, the protein that produces the copy of the DNA. 
and of course, the instructions not only to synthesize the DNA polymerase, the instructions to synthesize the RNA polymerase and to synthesize the ribosome have to be encoded in the DNA sequence. And this is what happens, right? Different regions of this DNA sequence encode the instructions to generate the proteins that will make possible to make an exact duplicate of the cell. So these regions, these regions that, uh, that give rise to these proteins are called genes. And the set of all genes in a cell are called, is what you call genomes. Of course, there are no cells, there are no, there are no cells as simple as this in the Earth today. This is the simplest uh, organism or the, it was when it was sequenced, Mycoplasma genitalium. As you can see, this gene has not three, this, this, this organism, it has not three genes, it has 470 predicted protein coding genes that include the genes required for DNA replication, transcription and translation, the basic processes of life, plus, of course, many other genes that are involved in many other processes that are necessary for the cells to survive, like for instance, transforming the energy from the exterior into the energy that you require to carry out the chemical reactions. This is, uh, anyway, so this is uh, the proteins that are generated by this, by this, uh, in this, in this, or in some other, but that's, that's not the matter. These are proteins generated by these 470 genes in this genome. So what I mentioned so far is, is something that can be applied to, you don't see my pointer here, right? No, 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 no. Okay, well, you have to believe me. So essentially everything here, but what it says is eukaryota, right? Can be defined by the model that I just presented. Now, in the small corner of all com com co uh, life complexity, there are species that are called eukaryotes. And in these eukaryotes, Ah, vale. gracias, gracias. And in these eukaryotes, things are a little bit more complicated. We are eukaryotes, right? There is an internal compartment within the cell that separates these processes. Replication and transcription take place in something that's called nucleus. The resulting RNA is exported to the outside, which is called cytosol, and it is translated here. Why this happened? I don't know, but this is what happened on Earth. And this generates a multitude, and then, of course, in addition to these genes, we have many, many other genes, and these additional genes is what produce the amazing, the amazing diversity of forms that you see in life. Now, if we just go even in a more remote corner of this tree of life, something that you can read here, I forgot the name, is called Ophistocorta, Ophistocorpha, or something like that. This group here of things, in this small corner or of life beings, things are a little bit more complex because something happens about 600 million of years ago. 600 million of years ago. Uh, so the cells, when they duplicated, usually they separated, they it went their own way. But at some point, the cells start to remain together, right? So they form colonies. They form colonies. These colonies become more and more complex, and there were maybe hundreds of cells. And then they, when they were too large, they split, forming new colonies. Right? This is the origin of multicellularity, of multicellularity. So we have a unicellular protist, they become colonies. With the time, some of the cells in these colonies are specialized to have different functions. For instance, in these this particular cells, in this particular colony, some of the cells became right, the motor uh, uh, cells that actually locomotor cells, so that make possible for the colony to move. Some of the others were responsible to having the food. And with time, some of the cells are specialized in reproduction, which means that the cells were not specialized. They were able to regenerate the entire colony. So the way in which, the way in which these colonies reproduced to itself was through these specialized cells that left the colony and were able to generate a new colony with the specialized cells. And I'm sorry I will not talk about sex, but I think it's very important because in sex, the new colony can only be generated when you have two gametes from two different colonies. And this is 
extremely important that is beyond the top of today. So this is the reason that's the, the types of cells that we find in our body, right? We find the sex cells, but we have bone cells, blood cells, muscle cells, skin cells, and I'm finishing now. I know that it is late. And you may ask, but you may find a problem here. I say, well, see, all these cells came from the same cell. All the cells have the same DNA. All the cells have the same genes. All the genes produce the same RNA and the same proteins. How come that the cells are different if they have all the same DNA and the same genes? Well, the reason why this happens is because not all genes are active in all cells. Not the RNA produced by the genes is produced in all cells. For instance, in the cells, which I don't know what they are, maybe astrocytes, only a few of the genes work and produce RNA in other cells. A different set of genes works and produce a different neurons. I think is this, right? Well, whatever. Uh, cells. And it's not only that. Sometimes it's the amount of RNA being produced by the genes which leads to a cell that's different from another, etc., etc. Right? And again, the way it's the way in which this is uh, the way in which this is regulated is through motifs, so through a code that it's present in the sequence of the DNA. Right? Particular combinations of motifs of letters are the ones that regulate how genes are work. We call it, we, we use the, the term express when they are transcribed to RNA. So let me let me finish with uh, with what I think is a quite good, of course, it's imperfect definition of life on Earth. Right? So on Earth, uh, a living being is an individualized system made of one or more DNA molecules, plus the molecular machines need to produce a copy of these DNA molecules. And this is the important thing, such that the instructions to build the machines are encoded in the DNA molecules. And I think that, I don't know, I guess that, I guess because when, when you understand, when you understand quantum physics, you can't understand anything. Because Erwin Schrödinger brought this 10 years before the DNA was <laughs> the DNA was was uh, structure of the DNA was discovered. So it says the chromosome structures are at the same time instrumental in bringing about the development. They for sure they are low code and executive power, or to use another symbol, they are at the same time the architect's plan and the builder's craft in one. So they are, and this is important. They are the means and the goals in the same thing. And this, I'm sorry, Alfonso, I disagree strongly with what you wrote. In, um, you will be sorry. <laughs> no, uh, uh, I strongly disagree with what you wrote. Uh, I mean, other than that, that's the only thing, which actually that's the only sentence that I could find that I would disagree with you when you write this. You say, cells are not more piles of genes that the house is a pile of bricks. No, no, no. The bricks are the bricks and are the plan to build the house. That's the thing. That's what makes life unique on Earth. And let me, I'm, no, I know that I am in love with Erwin Schrodinger, but he wrote something that I don't think we are aware of this, right? So what I wish, I wish to make clear in this last chapter is in short, that from all we have learned about the structure of living matter, we must prepare to find it working in a manner that cannot be reduced to the ordinary laws of physics. And this is the person that this invented quantum physics or uh, quantum statistics or whatever. I think he, he did, right? So because we think that all natural phenomena can be reduced to the laws of physics. And actually, I think that he is right. Because there is nothing in the laws of physics that says that these three letters, A, T, C, have to produce this amino acid. Nothing in gravity theory, whatever thing, right? Electron, there is nothing, nothing. And I want to finish with this sentence of a friend of mine that in the book that he wrote, because he wrote these things for billions of years, because it's the, it's, is a question of information, right? It's a question of information and information processing. So he writes this, for billions of years, all durable information present on Earth was almost exclusively recorded in DNA or other polymer molecules. And this is exactly what it happened. But a few hundred thousand years ago, well, maybe more recently, this changed. 
human language emerged, providing an alternative means for recording and transmitting large amounts of information from individuals to individuals and from generation to generation. So, the way in which life works is not more dependent on the laws of physics than the way in which we speak, right? The meaning of our words, something like that. So, with this, I will finish and uh, I will thank you for your patience because maybe I was too long. I don't know. No, actually, it says 18 minutes. You told me 20, no? It's okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, Good. Yes. Okay, Let's well. hope we have enough. No, no, I think it's okay. I have you made your point. So um, now, as you've seen, uh, I'll, sí, sí, the other speaker, no, who I'm going to introduce, no, no Alfonso Martinez Arias, vale. has been taking really very quick notes. Uh, I don't uh, know if he's going no, to change. No, you took also my paper. <laughs> yeah, because I, I want to, because I asked for a paper. Yeah. <laughs> Que no, que no, que voy, a, voy a pedir otro. Sí, pero el bolígrafo, ¿qué? You don't need more than one. Well, I don't know if he's going to be as quick as you did. So, while he's just uh, the microphone and he can talk, I'm going to introduce him. So, Alfonso Martinez Arias, I'm going to define himself as he actually defines himself. As born and bred in Madrid, where he obtained his PhD, his degree in biology, and brewed, like the good beer, wine, in Chicago, where he did his PhD on genetic engineering in yeast, and in Cambridge, where uh, he went for a postdoc with one of the best uh, developmental biologists of the world at the moment, Peter Lawrence. And then, instead of moving away, he stayed there. I think there is... And he stayed there because you know how nicky picky uh, British researchers are. They are really, really very exigent. And they on, not only demand that the people that are there are good at the, you know, experimental work, but that they know how to elaborate ideas and defend themselves. So I think that uh, that, that was also, that, that, that brewing also allowed you to to learn, probably because it is your natural talent, how to elaborate ideas and how to defend them. So in Cambridge, he became successively lecturer in genetics, director of the Center for the Physics of Medicine, uh, to end up being professor of developmental mechanics. And the name has a ring here, which already tells us what he was really doing and what are his interests. So he is a leading developmental biologist, fascinated on how cells grow, how they talk, how they interact, from one single cell at the very beginning of an embryo, and how they end up just to build the organism. So we have him now here as an Agrea professor in Barcelona, and, and he's now working on early mammalian development, also, indeed, that means in human early development. And he, he never refuses to talk about his passion, the cell, as you're going to see. He has recently written, actually, a scientific divulgation book. Uh, the, the title is The Master Builder, where he puts into words all his ideas about the cell being more important than the genome. But also I would like to, to say that I know him from quite a while and he's a born argumentalist, if this word exists in English, and a master fencer of ideas and concepts. So now the floor is yours, Alfonso. So. Thank you. I hope we can hear that fine. So I should start by saying that, that I also remember yeah, I have the microphone. So that I remember the days of the CRG, I think they were a learning experience for all of us. I think that that was a seat even from Jaume, I can see that. Uh, so it was not only that, that to learn whatever I can remember being able a reference for anything, but, but it was a very important moment also in, in my life. And, and I think we all learn uh, as I think. Um, if this was a court, and the ball is now on the side of the, I don't know if it's the defense of the prosecution, I would say that you've just heard an argument 
that is not wrong, but is partial. I think what you just said is a very reductionistic view of life. We all know that life is not what Roderick has said. I mean, that's obvious. It doesn't need, it doesn't need any explanation. But what he has said is a part of life. I, I think I'd like to rephrase the, the element of this discussion. It's not so much what is more important, but I think my question is and, and has been, what is the relationship between these two elements? The genome and the cell. And what I would like to do in my presentation is to tell you why do we need a cell side view of biology and what its relationship is. is. And I'd like to, to give a little bit of background to this question. And, and it's not going to be very, very expansive. I think we might need in the end more time than we have. The, the whole story starts with this problem. It's, it's a problem that, that arises at the end of Darwin. Darwin, as you know, is the, the, the great unifier of biology and puts forward the theory of evolution, which all of a sudden, in a very obvious way, as, as Huxley said, it's so obvious why didn't I think of it before him. It, it's just that, that the variation of life on Earth develops progressively through the selection of characters that are adaptable to particular states. But Darwin has a problem. I mean, he can explain how did the same way that breeders select certain kinds of dogs or certain kinds of pigeons, nature is selecting from a variation that is presented to it things that are adapted to the particular. But the question that he has is what is being passed on? How, how these characters that are selected, how can they be passed on? He has a problem because Roderick might be a bit shy to talk about sex, but biology is about sex. And sex is the essential element of, of biological systems. And if you've selected a character and you breed it, the individual that has that character breeds with another that doesn't have it, all you're going to do is have that character. And therefore, over several uh, generations, it will be diluted out. And Darwin wrestled with this problem for many years and never came to a conclusion. But what he had established is that life on Earth had evolved through continuous variation of these characters. Now, um, in an obscure place in, in, in Central Europe, uh, this monk that we all know, Mendel, discovered the, what was hidden there. It took time for it to be around, but the, the surprise was that what was being passed on were units, were integers. They were not continuous. And this creates a, a little problem, which is how uh, units that are discrete can create continuous variation. And this was, this was a, very, a very serious problem for many years until the mathematicians get into the business. And this man, uh, Ronald Fisher, manages to explain in, in, a, in a very serious uh, series of work, which at the same time lays down the basis for the statistics. He explains how these uh, units that are discrete can give rise to the continuous variation that, uh, that, that, that Darwin had in his mind. That finds its shape and its form in what is called the modern synthesis, which basically is very gene-centered and in a way that continues along the lines that Roderick has explained. Uh, the iconic double helix, the, the genomes, it becomes very easy. We digitize life. That's, that's what Roderick has done for you. He's digitized life. We can understand uh, these things. And, and there is the, the fact that there are diseases that map to single genes, not all of them, but, but many of them, start making, uh, accept the mirage that our life is represented in our genes. And to a certain extent, there is truth in the same way that when you buy an object in the supermarket, there is a barcode there that is associated with, the, with that object. And for me, in a way, the DNA is a kind of barcode. And I don't have a problem with anything that, uh, well, with most of what Roderick has said. That's why I was taking notes, so we'll take him to court later. But, but the thing is that, that uh, the, the problem is when at the end of the 20th century, and you can look at the 20th century as the century of the gene. It's born with the discovery of Mendel's laws, and it ends up with the, uh, the draft of the human genome. So all, all that happens in the 20th century. It is when on the occasion of presenting the first draft of the, of the human genome, you get this kind of a statement. Genome, the genome is the map of life. Genome is like a GPS. We now have a map that tells us how different organs are different from one another, which is what, what Roderick has said. The human genome sequence is the genetic blueprint of a human body. I mean, for any developmental biologist, this creates some questions, okay? Because when you come to it, you come down to it, 
the only truth about the genome in these hyperbolic statements is what Roderick had said. The only blueprint in a gene is a blueprint for another gene. There is not a blueprint for the organism, as I will show you in a minute. What there is is a blueprint for another gene. That, that's what it is. However, if someone has done more than any molecular biologist or molecular genetics to put the gene at the center of our lives, is this British gentleman here, Richard Dawkins, with this book of the late 1970s, The Selfish Gene. Uh, I presume many of you will be aware of this book. And when I read it as a student, there was one idea. It, it has two very, very important ideas. One, it's very popular and it grabs your imagination. The other is very scientific. And the two ideas are there. The first one is that the selfish gene idea, his idea is that, that, that genes are selfish because they are the units of life and what they want is to reproduce themselves. And the selfish gene idea is the idea that the animal is a survival machine for its genes. The animal is a robot that has a brain, eyes, hands, and so on, but it also carries around its own blueprint, its own instruction. This is a very brutal idea. As when I was a student, it captured me that we are just machines that the, that the genes build in order to compete with each other. The more scientific idea is why do I say that the gene is the unit of selection rather than the group or even the individual? Because in this very reductionistic view of, of evolutionary biology, and that's really from the beginning, these two fields, evolution, genetics, they go together. If you explain inheritance, you explain evolution. This is something that, that happens all the time. So a successful gene can persist in the form of copies for hundreds of generations while animals group and species die. I recently heard him in a, he's a great speaker, he's a great popularizer, okay? Uh, I just think his ideas are wrong, but that's a minor point when someone is very good at, at, at expressing his, their ideas. And I think, I think that, that while, while they, they have an influence and an importance, as I will show you, he has his shortcomings, like, like most of us. I think basically what he says, if you wait a million years, 10 million years, what is left of the animal is the genome. That's something that he says. I mean, the animal disappears and the genome remains. We'll see to that in a minute. The basic idea of the gene at the center of our life is, as uh, Roderick has expressed, is that of a replicator. And that's really what lies at the center of that statement by Dawkins, because he believes that the important thing, what is in the essence behind Darwin's comment and Mendel and Fisher, is that when you get a character that is good and that is selected, it gets imprinted in the genome and that was passed on, all right? So that's why it's what is selected. That is his point of view. For those of you who don't know who Richard Dawkins is, he's a, a, behavior, a behavioral ecologist. I mean, that, that's very, very far. I know that Jaume will represent it in a different way, but you know, I'm just giving you elements for a discussion in case I haven't already given you any. But the fact is that what Dawkins, Dawkins has a problem, and I say he's a behavioral ecologist, and at the time that he's writing the book, it's interesting, it's the 1970s, we don't know very much about development. We don't know very much about cell biology in the, in the modern way. So he makes this jump that, that genes build machines, creating a big gap in between. And his idea is replicators, and he thinks that the only thing that can replicate, that can pass on, is, is, is the DNA. But actually, cells are great replicators. The membrane systems of the cell cannot be reconstructed from the genes. If you, if you strip a cell from its membrane systems, the genes will never reconstruct them. So from the beginning, you have these two things coming together into something. A cell, the membrane of a cell needs a membrane as a template as much as a molecule of DNA needs a molecule of DNA to be propagated. In fact, I didn't want to touch on the issues of the origin of life, which I don't find a terribly interesting question, but there is a lot of theories and disputes, and it's not impossible that cells as energetic units without any DNA or genetic material evolve in parallel to the informational content, and both came together. I don't find it interesting because we're never going to find out, but that's a different matter. However, the most important thing is what I said, forgetting these uh, little intricacies of the membrane systems of the cell. The, the point that I just told you is what, what in a very provocative manner, uh, Dawkins says is that it's wait a million years and the only thing that is left of you or me will be our genomes. However, again, his lack of interest on developmental biology and for what I'm going to say, all he had to do was to the 1860s or to go to the 1870s, is that there is one cell type in our body that is eternal and is the germ cells. And the germ cells are eternal. They are in a cycle 
continuous cycle. The first thing that happens, you develop from a germ cell from your mother and a germ cell from your father. And the first thing that happens in the embryo before it engages into making an organism is that these germ cells are set aside and passed to the next generation. So the germ cells are completely eternal as much as their DNA that they carry. That's why I like to call them vessels or, or time capsules for, for genes, all right? And this is, um, I will say for the discussion, an argument about clones, which, which, which comes with this, but, and, I, and I hope that, that Gemma and, and does not forget to ask me about it. Now, so that, that's so, so much about the, the, the statement that, the, that there are replicators and that the gene is the only replicator. Now, the other statement is that the animal is a robot that has a brain dice and that is basically a direct product of the DNA. Well, we have a test. You know, as they say in English, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So we take this and twins are very simple. They have identical genomes. So we would expect them to be identical. There is a way, a scientific way of doing that. I should point out that twins have very different fingerprints, but you also have different fingerprints. Every one of your fingers has a different fingerprint, although they all have the same DNA. That's why you can only open your phone with one hand and one finger, not with the finger of the other hand. So you can do what it's called concordance studies, which it looks at the degree to which uh, monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins share characters. And these are disease characters, or it could be many, and the concordance is very low. In fact, I would think that there is a psychological element when we look at twins which, allow, which forces us to see similarities and to avoid differences. But twins are probably more different than we think, and the, the sort of genetic analysis of it with the concordances, and that's quite a recent study, reveals a, a lot of discordance in something that shares the genomes completely, and shares even the, the maternal environment. We're not just talking about the education, maternal environment, genome, and there are discordances. And I think that, that, that what is missing, again, is, is, not, is not that anything that, that, that Dawkins has said, which I should say also for those of you that don't know, and Dawkins never hides it, Dawkins does not invent the theory of the selfish genes. This was, this was developed over many years by two very illustrious evolutionary biologists, Bill Hamilton and George, uh, what, what, uh, I forgot the name now. But, but it's, it's too very important, and what he does is he gives it a veneer of, um, George Williamson. Uh, it, it gives him a veneer of, of, of popularity and, and makes these metaphors, he's very good at that, that are very, very powerful. And, and not without right. So I'm not saying that there is anything wrong in anything that, that Roderick has said. I'm saying that there is more and that we avoid it at our peril, that we do need to, 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 to focus on things that we don't know, and I will show you some examples at the moment, and that the missing link, the missing element is the cell. Because in a way, what, what you know, in a way, um, Roderick has stopped at the nanomachines. The cell, it's, it's, it's an ensemble of nanomachines, and the, the nanomachines are encoded in the DNA. And it is when they find themselves in this environment of a cell, and maybe this happened at the origin of life, that there were these two things going on in parallel, these micelles with energetics going on, these reproductive, they came together. Now they can do very interesting things that they wouldn't do on their own, because it is the cells that control and change completely the way the DNA works, the way those the machines work, and more importantly, the, the cells start creating tissues and organs. In the next three or four slides, I'm going to mention two or three things, and probably are the most important, that cannot be explained by genes and by our current understanding of, of, of the way genes work. I should also point out, because Roderick mentioned it, and we can come back to it, that the transition, he is right in saying that most of what exists on the Earth is unicellular. That, that we are an exception, and a very interesting exception. And that exception happens when multicellularity arises. The jump from unicellularity to multicellularity, and I'm not talking, this is for the experts on colonial multicellularity, I'm talking about clonal multicellularity, that doesn't happen simply because there are more genes. And the work here in Barcelona of Iñaki Ruiz Trillo is very, very important in this regard. So let me highlight for you two or three things that I'm not here to challenge Roderick, I'm, I'm here to converse with him, and I'm saying that there is nothing wrong in what he says, but I don't think we understand, for example, uh, things like size and scaling, you know? I mean, th this is something that you can find thousands of genes that are associated with size, but that doesn't mean that we understand how size 
how different organisms with the same genes generate this very variable size. And I should say that we are not that different from an elephant. And scaling is very important. You can see there from one of these awful pictures from colonial uh, Britain, uh, the, this collection of people of different sizes. They are of different sizes, but they are proportioned. That is to say, the, the space that occupies the, 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 the head relative to the rest of the body is the same in all of them. And the scaling and size are not something that we understand. The little fly on the right is called Tinkerbella nana. Tinkerbell, you might recall from Peter Pan, and, and is the little, the little tinker that goes around putting powder that allows people to fly. That is a fly which is smaller than a paramecium, which is a single cell animal. That has neurons, it has muscles, it has everything. In fact, its neurons do not have nuclei. And they work perfectly well because, you know, nuclei create a lot of space. So if you're going to be so small, you get rid of the nuclei. So there you have an animal that is functioning without any DNA. Now, another very interesting problem that I, I find I wrestle with is homeostasis. Homeostasis, it, it's quite a remarkable feature that is happening in all of you as we are sitting here. For example, I mean, it's remarkable. Every time I, I, I see this slide, I have to double check that I have not made a mistake. You are making 2 million red blood cells per second. At this moment, your body is making 2 million red blood cells per second. And in fact, it's making proportionate uh, numbers of all the other blood cells under a control that we still don't understand. And it's very, very good because if you go off by a few thousands, you have a leukemia, you have anemia, you can have a disease. I don't, this, of course, is using genes, but this phenomenon is, is clearly that, that we still don't understand it. Uh, this is, I, I could comment on this inter interesting slide from the New York Times. Turns out in your body, every tissue is sticking, is turning over at a particular rate. My favorite one is the bones every 10 years, because when your jacket doesn't fit, it's not because you've grown, it's because your bones have changed. Just remember that one. But I think every part of your body, your skin is changing every two weeks, your intestine every week, your liver, everybody, there is bits of our body, the eye, that's why it's there, it, it's, it's very fixed, or, or the brain, it doesn't turn over. And, and that leads to very interesting molecular specializations for these kind of cells. But all these objects, and, and this is, they are not the work of genes. Genes involved in, the, in their separation, but they are the work of cells. And cells is what, what drives this. And as I said, because I think the problem that, that Dawkins had is that, that he comes from a school that thinks of the gene, as, as Jame would say, and I think this is a big dichotomy, I mean, in a way, we've seen it in, in Roderick. Roderick is a molecular biologist. For him, a gene is a molecule that encodes a, a number of RNA, proteins, etc. For a, and that, that's a bit closer to the way I think about the gene. For a population geneticist, it's a gene frequency. It's an allelic frequency. And there is a gap in those things that I don't think we have breached. Because the bit that is missing in the arguments of, uh, of Dawkins is, is development. The product of the cells is development. And the biology of the cell and the biology of development is one of the things that are being missed in, the, in, the, in, in that. And I think if we come to that, if we reckon with the role of cells and their creation, we are going to get a vista of biology that at the moment we don't have and is partial. There you have several embryos in development. The one on the left is Drosophila, the one on top is Zebrafish, you have a chicken underneath and a mouse on the top right. All that activity, all that dynamics, it's using genes, but it's not encoded in the genes. I can assure you of that. Okay? It's interesting that in the most famous piece of scientific literature, Roderick has claimed that it's the paper of Watson and Crick. We can argue on that too. I think it's an interesting paper. In the 20th century. 20th century. We can argue about that, but, but I find... I find that, I find that um, a very, that, that is the last paragraph of the origin of species. And it's an absolute beautiful piece of literature. I'll read it for you. There is grandeur in this view of life. He's spent 400 pages telling you things. And he says, with its several powers having originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. It's interesting that in the first edition, that ends of wonderful, have been and are being created, and he switched it to evolve. And that, that's an interesting change of thought, because, because the book doesn't address at all how those forms are created. 
even if touches very, very subliminally about how they are being evolved. It's a book a friend of mine always reminds me it should be called uh, the, the Evolution of Adaptation. Not so much the evolution. Even It's very worrying when I see you agreeing with me, Jaume. Very, very worrying. In fact, in another very interesting and, and less, less uh, known bit of, of, of biology, this is the, the beginning of the book of Fisher, the man that officiates this marriage between, um, between uh, evolution and, and, and genetics. And he starts by saying natural selection is not evolution. I should say I reread this preface recently and it's a very impressive piece of writing. If you want a physicist thinking about evolution and genetics, Roderick, read that preface. It's very, very impressive. So, because as I say, when we look at, for example, the development of your ear from a little jawbone of, of a reptile, or of a, that is not a matter of genes. It's a matter of cells looking, searching a space, building. The real builders are the cells. And that is in, in my penultimate slide, you know, what, what Darwin, what, excuse me, what Dawkins would like to say is that the hen is a gene's way of making copies of itself. However, in the view that I give you, I think a genome is a cell's toolbox to make hens. It's not the one that is building the hen, it is the cell. And I think that's going to give us a, a very different view. People, and, and I think that is a, a, a statement, a moniker that was. Uh, suggested by, by Dawkins, you can have a genes view of life, but I think what we need is a cell side view of biology, not to substitute the gene side view, but to complement it, because I do think that, that we have at this moment a problem. We can enter, and I'll be very happy in responding to questions to discuss the, the, the societal implications of this gene-centric view, because when you think about COVID, when you think about immunotherapy, when you think about cognition, cardiovascular disease, aging, embryos, of course, think about whatever you're thinking about issues of cells. The solution to COVID came from a vaccine, but it's a vaccine which is you're changing the cells, the cells, and there is much that we don't understand because we don't understand the cells. And I would claim that this is something that, that we need to explore. As I said, not to substitute, but to change. So there we are. When Roderick was defining cell and genome, by repeating the definition of cell was taken from the old definition, by repeating the definition of genome was taken from the second definition. Good catch. Have I decided, of course, it's always new. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give me. you the answer. When I arrived to England, <laughs> no, somebody gave is, me the answer to that question. I think it's better uh, not no, to no, put no, it into good. code. So can, I, can I say why I did this? No, I didn't, but I just realized. No, because of course I wanted to get the definition of the same dictionary, but I went to the internet and uh, I found the, and did this very recently, I found the definition of cell in the Oxford dictionary and I just put it there. And then I searched for the definition of genome and I had to pay. <laughs> I know, but well, because I, it was the second. But very simple. simple. I went to the Cambridge dictionary that was free. Okay. Very and, simple, Roderick. Somebody told me who had the problem to send their daughter to school and they said, if you want her to learn how to talk, send her to Oxford. If you want her to learn how to think, send her to Cambridge. If you want her to learn how to work, send her to London. Okay. I don't know I... <laughs> well, we can discuss this because so I, did my, I did my postdoc in Oxford, so I don't agree with you. Okay. So while maybe people can just write down uh, in the, in the people that are in the streaming, if they wish to just produce any, any question, Maybe we can just, uh, well, before giving the, the word to the people in, I think that maybe Roderick, very, very shortly, it's going to be appreciated. Do you wish to make a sentence or something uh, to Alfonso, or do we give the word? I agree with him. I mean, we are both giving partial views of what is biology because we have different perspectives. There's something in Spanish called uh, Nada es verdad, nada es mentira. Uh, and I am looking at this from a different perspective than Alfonso and we have different views and the nice thing is that the views are complementary but I have, uh, I still actually, I still maintain my position that the genome is what defines an organism and I like to ask this question to Alfonso. Well, we, we can just... work on this idea because I, I understand what you mean because I think that Alfonso was very, you know, uh, you're very agile and dexter. So what you said is okay. 
uh, you know, the genome does not contain what makes a cell. But I suppose that Roderick is not completely fully agree with this because you make you can have, uh, let's say, instructions to make things to work in a certain way. I don't know. Is that what you mean? Well, no, but I mean, it's very simple. So you put the example of the twins and they are different and they, but I have this question to you. So let's take well, a piece of okay. music. Question from? from yeah, okay. let's take a, a piece of music, the nine, symphony number no. nine from Beethoven, right? So there is something that Beethoven wrote. There is a music sheet, there is a script. Now, there are thousands of versions of the uh, Symphony Number no. 9 of Beethoven, pop, rock, jazz, multiple orchestras. What defines Symphony Number no. 9 of Beethoven? Beethoven. No. What who wrote defines, it? What who wrote is? it? Who wrote it? That, that's what, that's what so? defines. I mean, defines this is a text that then there are variations, but exactly. the, it needs a creator, but it needs a creator and it needs an interpreter. Right. But without a creator, right. I mean, there is no, and there are no, there is some instructions there. I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's, a, it's a good, it's an interesting um, argument, but I think we, you also need an orchestra to interpret it. You need a, a conductor. Right. Otherwise, it's just a of piece of paper. Exactly, exactly. It's a piece of paper. Exactly. No, no I agree. But what defines, I totally agree. No, but what I, defines? Yeah. I mean, what I you mean, say, it, this is the symphony well, number nine of Beethoven. It's not the interpretation that the, or the symphony or the Philharmonic of, of, of Philadelphia is producing or the Orchestra Ciudad de Barcelona or the rock singer. What defines symphony number nine of Beethoven is the, is the, is the, is the, is the script that Beethoven wrote. Because it's identical in all cases. And the interpretations yeah, yeah, are multiple. But this is, pardon? No, no, no. I, I think I think it's an interesting. It's a, but I think that that's going to lead us um, uh, about about how it's written, what is in the score. I mean, how the score is interpreted. Because without an interpreter, that score means you nothing. You cannot write. That, that means no, nothing. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and I think also the the way it's written, it 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 creates. In fact, it's a product of cells. The the, the score of Beethoven is the product of cells. I mean, there is no question about that. I mean, that, that's something, the neurons and the, the handwriting, the piano coordination, all the trials and errors that the brain has. So without, without cells, I don't think we would have this argument. Of course. Thank you very much to both of you. It has been uh, an excellent, uh, the way you have shown your views. Uh, on that, uh, I mean, I personally, as Alfonso knows very well, I am aligned with Roderick uh, in, my, in the way of thinking. But I would like to just to argue here uh, one, uh, one tip of information that has not arise yet in the discussion, which is the, the lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge, uh, uh, whether uh, the, to understand how the genome works till making different cells, to which extent the information is there and we, what we still do not understand is how we can understand any cell from the, a molecular point of view. Not, I'm not just saying a genome, I'm saying molecular, okay? So uh, the, 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 the main idea here would be if we have a full molecular knowledge of the DNA and all participants in a cell, do we? know the cell? Can we anticipate? I suspect that according to Roderick, yes, according to me, no. But I, but I will give you an answer to that question on the issue of cloning. If all the information is in the genome, why when you clone an animal, you have to put that DNA in a cell from that animal? Yes. Because if all the instructions are there, it really doesn't matter. If, if you know this is this is not true in this the sense true. that you need you need an environment. No, but but it could be you know people are now very interested in doing this cloning of the mammoth and they want to use an elephant. Why don't use a mouse after all? The genome <laughs> contains all the instructions. It must be much easier to use a mouse. So that's telling you that there is a problem. In fact, when this is tried, 
it doesn't work because obviously the cell knows things that the genome doesn't. Just no, no, <laughs> the environment. This is a debate. Um, uh, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Uh, I, I'm not a biologist, but I understand that there is sort of, some sort of debate about uh, if the cell is something that the DNA creates to reproduce itself, or, uh, or if the cell, or if the DNA is something that the cell has to reproduce the cells. So let me put it another way. What came first? The, the DNA can just create cells, or historically, what came first? DNA or cells? I mean, I'll be brief and then I'll leave. I, I think, as I said, I don't find very appealing thinking about the origin of life is too theoretical. I don't think we, but I understand that there are two very different schools. One which you could call the metabolic school, which thinks that metabolism was going on independently. I mean, DNA is information. That's what we are talking well, about. But no, and that, that information existed. Let me, let me think, I'm sorry. I'm sorry but I'm curious about it. So this is an open matter? Completely it's open. Not, completely open. Known. Completely open. I, I and there think, are schools, different schools. I think that Roderick uh, did something that is interesting in a way. Um, it's not answering, but in a way, it makes a different kind of nuance. So uh, genetic information was there before cells. Genetic information. How do you know that? No, no, but... <laughs> We can discuss this, but, but it, the point is, with RNA, you don't need much. But, no, but, 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 but you've made a statement, is, you've made a statement, a categorical yeah, statement. So well, I'd like to know, how do you know that's that? That's why, well, that's what we think, because it's, I, I think don't. it's, I do. But anyway, that's anyway, better. but that's not the point. The point that I was trying to make is that for, for something to be really alive, you have to put a barrier between what is inside to what is outside. You need things to do that work in a way. And then you need a kind of cell, whatever, however you define kind of cell. And the only thing that you can do in solution is water, because you need to make reactions. You have reactions. to do a third thing, Gemma. You have to do a third thing, which is to encode that cell Th in the, in the information. That's true. But, but the encoding could be, no, it's true. That, that's, that's what we don't know. That's what we miss. That's why it's fascinating. But I think that maybe, probably, at the very beginning of life, you needed the two things. Otherwise, you could have genetic information, but you could not separate and do things in a way that allowed you to replicate whatever it was. So I think that it's much more complex than just only one thing or just only the other thing. And that's why it keeps, you know, it's like a ping pong. In one way, you have the ball in your field, but then it goes back, and then it's true, you have the ball in your field, and it's like a ping pong. What do you think, Rodrik? Because I've been well, I mean, in you. terms of, I think this is, I agree with, uh, with uh, what Alfonso said, I think this thing of the origin of life is very difficult to resolve, because it's very difficult, we were not there uh, 3.5 billion years ago, so it's very difficult to know what happened. There was, a, I think, a very important book, it's quite old, it's the book by Operin, The Origin of Life on Earth. Since you are an economist, maybe you like it, because this book is written within the Marxist philosophy. And it's amazing, because it's the only book in biology, and I, I see the word materialism all the time, but actually it's a great book to understand how life on Earth started. But let me say something. Uh, some people claim that life on Earth starts with RNA molecules because this has been created. RNA molecules, in contrast to DNA molecules, have the capacity to catalyze their own replication. So there are, and you can, and this has been done. I don't think they have been found in nature. But you can, in the lab, create RNA molecules with a sequence that's able to, without any external uh, agent, to produce an exact copy of itself. So that's the reason why some people believe that RNA started with RNA, that DNA, that life started by RNA. It's a, it's a theory, right? I don't know. It's actually, I was quite interested in what you said, that there are these vesicles or these cells that actually can't reproduce themselves without DNA. 
this is also very interesting, right? So they grow and they, the components distribute between the two and then they let have me, two copies, let right? Let me burst your bubble. No, I didn't say that. Well, something like that. I said that, I said that, cells, like that. Yeah, yeah. But cells are replicators. The membranes are replicators independently. Exactly. Of the membrane. But this could happen that this could replicate in the original world, they, this, this mem these vesicles could be created is, and clearly people, they could separate it and all think, this. There is people that think like that, yeah. the ones that think that you have a vacuum metabolism. To me, yeah. the problem with this dispute is how do you encode the, the components of the cell in that RNA or DNA? That, that to me, it's a serious right. problem that nobody ever argues about. The two things have to happen probably at the same time together in a way of uh, some sort of dialogue, I think, otherwise. But as, Andrew, as, as Andrew had, did, didn't finish this. That has the property of a splitting in two, then growing a bit, and no. then. I see, no. Well, yeah, but. but no, that be done. Well, it, it, yeah. will, it will break after a certain trigger, it will break. Exactly, so this grow and they split, right? This is happened very often. I'm not there. a membrane biologist, I'm not going to. And I think it's a physical chemical type of property in solution when you have lipids and the kind of lipids. But, but for instance, the question, if it ever, you know, if exists life in another planet, wherever, probably we should agree that you need a source of information that is passed by because you need information and you need a flow of information, right? And then maybe you have to build things because if you don't have if you don't build how are you going to pass by the information so that something is maintained so probably if, instead of thinking it's like science fiction in, 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 instead of thinking of what it is now just project into another world fiction world how would you envision that in this world any kind of life would exist so, is it going to be a genome, kind of whatever it is, or is it going to be cell, whatever we define cell, or completely different? So, can I say something? Just, uh, just let me say something. So, I think this is what I think this is what I like of uh, Elvin S. Redinger. He just thinking how something could create such, how something simple could create such a diversity. The only thing that occurred to him is that there should be some encoding mechanism, which by using a limited number of units, you can create infinity of messages. Now, let me tell you something that we have not discussed here, and this may be controversial, because many people disagree, even biologists. Not all life forms are cellular. Virus do not, are not cells. In the virus, the DNA is compacted with the proteins. Now, viruses, even though I incline to believe that they are living beings, they don't fit my definition of life because they don't have, they don't have the instructions to encode the proteins that are able to make copies of what themselves. Does, I forget, they, what does a virus need in order to reproduce? I am, no, exactly, that's what, I, that's what I I'm saying. I can't remember now, what is it that's, called? That's, that's what I'm cell. saying. Yes, that's what, I, that's what I was going to say. So ah. they hijack, they hijack um. the proteins that have other cells, so they hijack the uh, DNA polymerase, the RNA polymerase, the ribosomes, they infect the cells and they hijack. But the viruses themselves are not cellular forms. They don't have a membrane. Yeah, but you've said that for the definition of life, my, according to my, accord, But they are I'm saying that's a debate because many people I call believe it life that... life in waiting. No, because many people believe that viruses are living beings. Many people believe they are not. They don't, they, they, I acknowledge that they don't fit my definition of life. They need to hijack from cells these other components. They have a symphony have, waiting to be played. They have maybe. a script of a symphony waiting to be played. So that's, that's an interesting thing. That, that's, there is a script there. Yeah, there is a script of information. But to without, hijack, without, the, without the orchestra. I think I think that probably um, I don't know if mo it's a right the time right or yeah, less. Yeah, oh, right? Okay, then please please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting debate. Uh, I would like just to point out that a basic question is unit of selection. 
selection, as Darwin was, the, the base of evolution. This is the origin, not Rodinger, sorry, Darwin. So the base is, which is the unit of selection? Uh, and I think I am more closer to the point of view that the first unit of selections are cells, not DNA. DNA do not, do not compete, probably in the beginnings, some 40,000 million years ago. Second question I would like to uh, point out to the speakers is that this is a meeting of humans. This is not a meeting of chimpanzees. However, we, our genetic material uh, only uh, differs from chimpanzees in about 1%. So, uh, something happens, obviously, because here we are humans and not chimpanzees. So, uh, this is a question to take into account. Yeah? So, well, that's... Well, I do agree that the selection does not, does, not, does not occur directly on the genes, and actually that's the beauty of biology. It was my insistence that the, the means and the goals are the same. So selection occurs on the phenotype, on the cells if you want, right? But because, according to my view, this phenotype is determined by genes, when you directly select for the phenotypes, indirectly select for the genes, because the phenotypes that are more successful in reproducing are determined by genes, and therefore, the genes that determine these more successful phenotypes are the ones that reproduce more likely. And this is the selfish gene idea of that twins. Essentially, selection does not occur on the genotype, it occurs on the phenotype. But the phenotype is determined the by problem, the genotype. The problem arises when there are features in an organism that are not encoded by genes. Like then size, this, this. homeostasis, shape, they are not encoded by then genes. They are and in fact, true. what is good what is good now is that there is a whole field, which interestingly is it's drawing a lot from physics which is starting to explain that. The transition from unicellularity to multicellularity does not appear because we have a new repertoire of genes. It's because cells acquire new properties with the genes they have. This is a, this is a, a fact that it's, that it's emerging. And by being blind to the need to understand these other properties, we are missing a lot of new phenomena and, and new views of biology. Which, which are starting to impinge in medicine, because it's absolutely clear that this very gene-centric view of the world is failing medicine in, in many ways. That doesn't mean that that, that is not important. It, oh. It's a piece, it's a piece of, the, of the puzzle. I could not agree, I more, with, I could not yeah, agree yeah, yeah, I more with you about the emphasis on this personalized medicine Look, and the genetics is wrong. This is, this is, no, I, did, I haven't not said wrong, that. Wrong, I haven't said that. Don't me. No, no, wrong it is, is not wrong. It is incomplete. No, not wrong, not there wrong. There is a difference uh, between, between talking about, about I never uh, said that. But, but, CRISPR, it's a demonstration that it works. Other than but, the fact that the, but, the diseases that can be treated with CRISPR are less than 5% of the diseases is, in the world. But the wrong is the assumption that there is a gene and a disease, right? The thing is that diseases are caused by the orchestrations of hundreds of genes that work together in the cellular context, and I could not agree more than that. I am not saying that cells are not important, of course. It's like an orchestra is important to play in a script, but what defines the piece is the I, script, not the orchestra. I <laughs> look forward to hear from you how you encode... Uh, maybe we, we should go for a second question from the public, and maybe we can enrich the debate. Thank you for this very fascinating discussion. I'm not a biologist myself, and my knowledge of biology goes barely beyond high school biology, but thank you very much for the. I was fascinated uh, by the fact how important, how much importance was given in the debate to the concept of a definition here, of a definition of life. I'm not quite sure that this is the right uh, way to discuss these two things, because in philosophy, we nowadays try to avoid speaking of definitions in too strong a sense, and it seems to me that much of the debate between you both was uh, about whether life can be defined in terms of genes or not in a very strong and demanding sense that normally is not accepted anymore, namely in the sense which has traditionally been called a real definition of something, something that, something, as opposed to a nominal definition of 
what is merely verbal use of a certain term in ordinary language or a little bit refined language. But in most areas of science, as far as I understand, we avoid talking about definitions in this very strong and demanding, demanding sense. What I think the debate is about is about explanation. What is the most important explanatory factors when we try to explain, uh, to talk about phenomena of life? I wonder whether that helps. And then the second point that I notice is that in both presentations, I heard almost every third sentence a new metaphor being introduced. A what? A new metaphor being introduced. Uh, genes are a language, a language of information, a plan, an architect, a machine, a robot, and many other things beyond. Uh, mm -hmm. And I wonder what mm -hmm. uh, of each talking. of you, which is your favorite metaphor and why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's uh, uh, the two of you have to answer. So uh, regard, I think thanks a lot for your intervention, and I I don't think I could agree more with you about the thing of uh, how difficult it is to define precisely terms. And uh, I think I started with this right with life and computation are not easy to define. And uh, I acknowledge the limitation of my definition. It's a computational definition of life. And it's just a sort of reductionist vision of life, if you want. And I do agree. I don't know how you put it, this, that you want it to be the way in which we should define things is more about, you said, operation, non operative terms. And I did it in the way in which you, is that what you said? life in the sense of as reducible to genomes as an ultimate definition, whereas you tend to say more, yeah, but that's the point. That's what I, want, what I want to have clarity about. What notion of definition are both of you committing yourself to when you're saying yes and no? How strong the definition is? You mean my definition of life? Is that what you're asking? How strong it is? Uh, more than an operational or a working uh, hypothesis. So you say operational, you oh, yes, operation. I think in my case, I would say that is, I would say, of course, this may be fanatism. It is more than operational, actually. But I actually think that I totally agree with you on the fact that probably we should work on the concepts from an operational standpoint. And operating on the DNA is very important. The cloning of Dolly, something that shows that that's not a definition of life, that's an operation that we did. And we took the DNA from one ship, the cell from another ship, we put them together in a cell in another ship, and then there was an animal. And this animal was a clone of the animal that gave the DNA. So if you want, this could be an operational view of how much I think is important the DNA versus the cell. I'm answering your question or... Yes. So I, I, I invite you. I invite you to review my my talk. I haven't used a single definition. I don't have a definition for life. What I've been asking is that there is an incompleteness in the way we see biology. It's an incompleteness. I should also say that I believe definitions are important. I talk a lot to physicists, and they find very frustrating biology because it's very loose and very. Uh, and that creates a lot of problems. Mathematics is precise. Physics is precise. But I haven't used any definition. I think I'm, I'm simply saying that there is an incompleteness in a view. I'm not talking about the definition, a view of life from, from the perspective of the genes. As metaphors, I love metaphors. I probably overuse them a lot of the time. Yes, uh, My favorite one is that the only blueprint in a genome is a blueprint for another genome. And that is a fact. It's not a metaphor. Say that, uh, indeed, this is just a, this is a description. This is not a metaphor. Uh, yeah, the last, right? Yeah. Okay. My name is Alvaro Agustin, and I am a doctor. And given that you talk about diseases, I thought that you might be interested in the view of a doctor. I don't know if there is any other doctor in, in the room. I work in clinic hospital. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, both speakers, great talk, great chairman, woman. I think that we need both. Actually, the question well, is, what is more what important I'm is, yeah. in my mind, nonsense. We need both. For the reason that you have explained, uh, genes have information, but you said that we need a context, we yeah. need a membrane, so we need a cell. Uh, I, I don't think that's very uh, difficult to understand. 
what to me is much more interesting following the metaphor of Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Yes, the script is there, and yes, you have the cell, which is the orchestra. But who's the director? Who's telling the genes? Now, in this cell, you have to express this set of genes and not these other ones. And in a given cell, who tells the cell, start growing and produce a tumor, or, 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 or a child who's growing, or stop growing? Do we know who directs the whole concert? You are the cell this is this is the question. Do you there? Well, I, so I, I am a developmental biologist. What I study is precisely this question. Yeah. And what we've learned over the last particularly 10 years is that there are properties of exchange of information between cells that do not map to the genome. In fact, in the case of tumors and in the case of diseases, physical injuries to cells in a certain state can induce a very dramatic change of state that is not is very difficult to associate with genes. But my point is that this is a new vista, a new landscape that we are starting to explore. And it is very clear, I could give you examples from our own work in which the numbers of cells define what that ensemble does that the same genome in different situations, the, the same cells, the same genome, in will do very different things simply because of the way they interact that we still don't understand. What I'm saying is that we need to open our minds and our research to those properties. So, no, come on. Well, you know, we don't believe in the, in the, in the magic kings anymore. <laughs> I, I think that maybe just to end, because uh, this is going, I mean, because it's very interesting in a way, that's why we keep talking and debating. I think that uh, I am trying to provide uh, one idea that has not come out, which is um, emerging properties. And I think that uh, the cells actually, when they interact and they talk, they have an emerging property. But emerging property from something, some, some, some information that is there that allows them to have these emerging properties. So the capacity, the potentiality is there because of the genome. This is my view, and I don't know if you agree, but maybe to end up. I think that when you focus on the genome, it's like zooming in, and when you focus on the cell, it's just a zoom out with different properties. And when you go to the organism, it's a more it's another zoom out. And if we go, for instance, for natural selection, I talk, I am a molecular geneticist, and I talk to my students about, you know, this protein does this and that and that. And then they think, why is not going faster? Or why is not doing this quicker? And I say, because, you know, the organism doesn't need it. Indeed, the cell doesn't need it. The organism doesn't need it. And because natural selection is not acting upon the gene or the cell alone, not even the individual is working on the population, which is even another zoom out. So I think that all these open questions is because it depends on where you are focusing, because we still do not know many, many things. And I think we need each other. This is a, an eclectic view, if you wish. But uh, the, the point is, is fascinating. I think that the 21st century is going to be fascinating because there's still so many things that we don't understand and we don't know. So, um, with this view, I think that uh, we can end. Thank you for being here, uh, listening and so carefully, and all the people that are still there. No questions from internet, so it's gone. I think everyone needs now to keep thinking about all the things that we've said. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you.